Good evening, good morning, and welcome everyone. A pleasure to be here today to share thoughtful ways in which you can accelerate human progress while leveraging the latest advances in technology. I am Lorena Puica. I am the CEO of SID IMYM, an AI-powered virtual companion platform empowering populations around the world with access to knowledge and tools to take charge of their life quality, irrespective of age, gender, ethnicity, location, and income level. Today, I am joined by fellow change leaders in the space of accelerating human progress by leveraging technology in the smartest and most empowering way. Pleasure to introduce you to Corey Lathan, Frida Pauli, Honek Tari, and Dinesh Maljani. So in order, I'll hand over to each to introduce themselves and to share a few of the insights and their views in terms of how their work and their commitments are accelerating human progress by leveraging technology in the smartest and most empowering way. Corey, may I hand over to you? Yes, of course. Thank you, Lorena. And I'm honored to be here and uh, joined with all my esteemed colleagues. Uh, as, as Lorena said, my name is uh, Dr. Corey Lathan, and I'm CEO of Anthrotronics, uh, a 20 year old biomedical technology research and development firm. And my company's name says it all, actually Anthrohuman Tronics Instrumentation. And our goal is to use technology to enable people to do things that they couldn't do before they had technology. I'm, I'm fundamentally a techno optimist. Um, I believe in the enabling powers of technology and we've used technology to uh, enable astronauts to control robots in space. We've used technology to enable children with disabilities to explore their environment. And we've used technology to help surgeons do remote surgery. So that's the first thing I'll say. I'm a techno optimist. The second thing I'll say is that um, we forget when we think about technology and the, the acceleration of technological know-how, we forget that humans are accelerating and changing as well. Uh, I was the World Economic Forum um, chair. Uh, I was the chair of the World Economic Forum's Council on um, Human um, Enhancement and Longevity. And we did a lot of work thinking about, you know, the human is an information processor. We take in information, we process it, and then we act on it. And we can improve that through technology um, in every part of the loop. So, for example, I believe as I get older, I'm actually going to improve. My eyesight's going to get better. Um, I'm going to have bionic knees. Um, I'm going to have a memory uh, chip that so I won't get Alzheimer's. Um, so I believe that we as humans are accelerating and changing as well. And then finally, I'll just end with, um, I'll paraphrase phrase a quote that's been attributed to many, many people, including Abraham Lincoln, and that's that the best way to predict the future is to create it. We invent the future, not machines. And with that, I'll pass it on. Thank you, Corey. Frida, may I invite you to introduce yourself and share a few of your thoughts? Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so my name is uh, Dr. Frida Pauli, and I spent 10 years as an academic scientist, uh, cognitive neuroscientist at Harvard and MIT before starting my company, Pymetrics. Um, so, you know, very excited to share a lot of the technology that was developed in the lab. Um, I commercialized the science uh, through the process of going through an MBA program at Harvard. Um, and, you know, it was it was at the business school that sort of realized that, you know, um, the process of understanding a person's fit for employment, um, broadly speaking, careers, employment is really at this point very uh, focused on understanding their experience, which is usually in the form of a resume. And there are so many other factors that one should consider about people in general when thinking about their optimal fit for a career or vocation. Um, or, you know, a job. And I think that's really the power of Pymetrics. We're a soft skill platform that really tries to understand some, a person holistically and make determination as to bet, best fit um, from a holistic perspective. Um, and it's also been very exciting, you know, just sort of transitioning from an academic career uh, into a commercial one and really seeing that, you know, the science that was developed, uh, you know, in the lab really has legs um, outside of the lab. Um, and the last thing I'll say is that I think this technology uh, and others, other technology platforms similar to Pymetrics uh, have 
applicability outside of employment. I think there are a lot of decisions that are st- that are made in education and financial inclusion and in other spaces that could be really uh, augmented by using similar type of technology where you're really trying to understand somebody more holistically. So it's my pleasure to be here and I look forward to joining this. Thank you very much, Frida. Mon, may I please ask you to introduce yourself? Absolutely, and thanks so much. And uh, great uh, to to follow both uh, Corey and, and Frida, uh, who obviously are, are leaders in and around technology becoming reality and being used in the world around us. I think for, for me, when I think of the topic of the conversation we're having today, there are a couple of questions that come to the surface. One is around what's in the title around humanism and, and the question of what do we actually mean by that? I think we often assume what that means is perseverance on one end of the spectrum. So we should be exactly as we've always been. Or on the other end, then the, then the end of the spectrum, we assume that uh, the digital age means everything shifting over to digital. And I think that question of what do we mean by humanism and what's our reference point? Are we right now the best version of what we could be? And if not, what could it augment, enhance, uh, help us become better at, at who we are? So I think that's one question. The second question is, whatever that definition we land on, then what is core to being human? And at least for me and in some of the work we do at Future Fit AI, that often is about our relationship to work, whatever form that takes, right? Whether it's a craft, whether it's a a hobby, whether it's a passion, whether it's a work that we're engaged in, paid or unpaid, but that relationship, it's deep in identity. It's deep in how we look at who we are and who we become over time. And so how does that relationship evolve over time? And and I have to say, unlike Corey, uh, I am a technology neutralist, even though I uh, work at a tech and AI company. Um, And and, uh, so I think there are questions around that. How does technology show up? How does it impact who we are as humans, how we relate to the things that matter most, like work, um, and particularly uh, at Future for AI in our work, our focus is on helping people navigate those pathways. So wherever I am and wherever I might go, what is a GPS that can help me navigate? What are inc- increasingly unpredictable, less visible, and less reliable pathways in and around the world of work? And looking forward to the conversation. <laughs> Thank you very much, Amon. Dinesh, may I invite you to take the stage? Yeah, sure. Thank you. And uh, wow, this is a very high powered panel. So I feel very privileged to be part of it. Um, So I actually founded this company called Smartin Spaces about four years ago. And I'm based here in Singapore. And, you know, my intent was to promote the whole notion of flexible working or hybrid working. And over the last uh, 12 to 14 months, that's all I've heard, right? I've heard so much about hybrid, etc. But I think to me, and I've seen this through my career, if you give an opportunity for people to participate from any country, from anywhere, at any place, uh, you know, huge things happen, right? I spent a long time at Cisco where, uh, you know, we used to make sure that the internet gets provided to sort of the rural area so education could become a reality and that equalized society, right? It would give everybody that opportunity. And now it's Martin, it's all about work. Um, I mean, today, I think there's an equal opportunity that's being created by technology for people to participate, people to learn, people to be able to work from anywhere. And I think that's true, uh, you know, value that technology brings, right? And I even look at, you know, whether it's, uh, it's, it's basically individual people or it's really small businesses that want to participate. I mean, I look at our own example and we've been able to, we're, we're, I'm, I'm sitting here and we're selling in sort of 19 countries around the world and we could be selling to 50 or 100 countries around the world. And I think it's just opened up huge opportunity, uh, you know, basically around the world. So hybrid working is what I feel uh, is going to be a game changer. And uh, that's something that I'm quite passionate about. And using tech, it will equalize society quite a lot. So I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Dinesh. It really looks like we're covering a wide spectrum of areas here today. Uh, definitely no shortage of uh, perspectives as well. Uh, everyone here has touched on technology's power as an equalizer. I'd like to 
encourage a conversation to ask for your thoughts in terms of how how do you think the technology that you're bringing the technology that you're bringing to the market to the world to to different demographics how are you making it affordable accessible sustainable how how are you ensuring that this is definitely equalizing the access to opportunity for people of any geography of any location any income level gender and beyond um i'll i'll hand over to Corey to start and then please please go on and have this as a conversation so yeah thank you for the question um you know i think it's something that needs to be kept in mind at the onset of any uh, any technology development um and you know we've had we've had several projects where the goal was to equalize healthcare for example um i'll, I'll just give you a, a couple quick examples um so so for example when we did a lot of work with kids with disabilities starting you know over 20 years ago Um kids with disabilities didn't have access to computers because it was very expensive to buy alternative devices um that were alternatives to keyboard and my and a mouse that were customized. Everything had to be customized. But the electronics revolution, the sensor revolution made it possible to capture um human capability. Um you know, whatever if someone with cerebral palsy, they could actually use um movements to interact with a computer or a device. And that was made affordable um by the consumer electronics revolution. So I think in a lot of ways where I live, which is trying to bridge that technology gap, um we're always looking for those opportunities where technology becomes affordable. I'll give you one other quick example. Um the the concept of brain health has really only in the past 10 or 15 years become part of our vocabulary because we understand how important it is to keep our brains healthy um not only to prevent the onset of alzheimers or hopefully um prevent um but also because of things like concussion and um and and all sorts of and depression mental health and but the reason one of the things that has been such a great that's been a great equalizer has just been the smartphone to give at every at our power at you know at our fingertips the ability to evaluate and track our own our own health um and so we've been working on using tools that are becoming more and more pervasive and i know smartphones are not available everywhere but but mobile phones was it you know that became an equalizer and so leveraging those platforms that we know are becoming available to expand um access to technology. So it it's we we've taken the other approach what technology is available and how can we use that to enable capability. Thank you Cory. Very very interesting. And I agree in terms of smartphones and platforms becoming becoming the great equalizers. I think we are all here to create that. I think it will be fascinating to see which of these platforms genuinely deliver on that promise in the same way that the smartphone did. <laughs> Over to you Frida. Sorry, unmuting takes longer than one would think. Um so look, we are very keen to realize the potential of fair and ethical artificial intelligence. Um there's obviously been a tremendous amount of scrutiny of the space um as there should be. Um and of course the EU is uh, leading the charge on that. um and we are actually welcoming of oversight um and other measures to ensure that artificial intelligence is created um and maintained in responsible ways and at pymetrics what that means for us is you know specifically we build artificial intelligence algorithms that are used in all sorts of employment decisions and so we have to be quite uh careful that algorithms are not only meeting regulatory standards um but in our opinion going above and beyond what uh what regulatory standards call for and for us that has meant not deploying any algorithm that would be discriminatory or show uh you know lack of statistical parity 
with respect to gender and ethnicity. And unfortunately, that has not been the case historically. There have been lots of automated, and not only historically, but historically and in the present day, there are lots of technology platforms um, and more antiquated hiring technologies whereby the impact um, on gender and race is either known to be not very favorable and or just unknown. Um, and so we really believe that, you know, as uh, as technology solution that's used in hiring and other employment decisions, you really have to ensure fair treatment of all. And for us, fair treatment means um, statistical parity in terms of the rates at which these tools um, select people of, of different backgrounds. And I think under under discussed, um, we focus a lot on gender and ethnicity, but there's also just the under discussed notion that, you know, people of different socioeconomic backgrounds of, of less privileged economic backgrounds are also oftentimes very um, left out, um, you know, of, of, you know, by these platforms. And so I think that there's a huge responsibility that we have as technologists to ensure that these algorithms are inclusive and used in built in inclusive ways used in inclusive ways and not just during the development phase but then also monitoring um that their that their deployment uh, continues to be inclusive so we are very staunch advocates thank you over to you hamon how how do you see that from from your perspective from the work you've done so far both in um future of work as well as AI perspective and how is that equalizing? I think Canada is an interesting context and I, uh, for different demographics, so I'd be curious of your thoughts. Yeah. And I mean, you know, for me, not, in some ways, this is, there's a personal element to this, right? I'm an immigrant kid who moved to North America without knowing English. Within two weeks of starting school, 9-11 happened, right? So a kid who looked like me, my parents were trying to get into work, having to change their name on the, on the resume, as Frida was mentioning, uh, reducing the education they had so that they would get uh, an interview for a more frontline job. Uh, and I think, you know, we've been using the word equalizer. I think there are a couple of ways I, I think about that. I am not personally convinced technology is a great equalizer, right? Even though we work in it, I think technology has the potential to do many things in both directions of the spectrum. Then the choice becomes about design application and where we invest less or more, right? And, and so an example of AI companies writ large, you've got a large number of those making choices around what kind of algorithms to design for which kind of use cases to deploy them in, and then where to put their investments and dollars in how those algorithms are improved. You have an example of someone like Frida and Pymetrics, who very intentionally from very early days have made the right choices to make it an equalizer. And you have the majority of the AI space that just doesn't do that. And so I think we just, we, we've got to be really intentional in how we think about this equalizing factor. Technology, I think, does two things. I think technology, lifts what is possible in terms of baseline foundation of access, but it significantly pushes the ceiling of what opportunity people can have, resources, opportunities as well. And so it actually doesn't necessarily greatly equalize. It expands the delta between the minimum and the maximum. Yes, it brings up the minimum, but it, it pushes out the maximum far more than it brings up the minimum on a regular basis. Part of that is because of where the dollars are going. So I think a big part of this conversation is often about what kind of founders, what kind of ventures, what kind of investments are we more and more supporting? Because that's really where the rubber hits the road, right? Technology itself is value neutral. AI is value neutral. It's the choices and design and investment and deployment we make that make the most fundamental difference, in my opinion. Brilliant spot on. <laughs> Before I pile on to that, Dinesh, over to you. Yeah, so I think, you know, much like as, as we basically talk about the future of work, you know, my sense is that what has happened over the last 12 months, uh, just around hybrid working and things like that, right? I mean, you know, so essentially a lot of people that did not live in large cities did not get the best jobs. I mean, if you're in New York or if you're in San Francisco or in Boston, obviously you have access to the best opportunity and jobs because you could just walk over interview and get into that particular organization but i think today uh, i mean we've seen this we're hiring from everywhere in the world and um you know all they need is they need the most basic technology they need a computer they need a internet they need zoom video or whatever and they're all set to go 
Um, it's just created a tremendous opportunity for them. Nobody's asking anymore, where are you from or what's your location? You just are the best talent. Um, you know, you kind of evaluate that and you make them part of your team, right? So somebody asked me the other day, like, how many offices do you have? And I said, well, we have hundreds of offices because everybody's home is an office right now. So it really doesn't matter. And I think that's very powerful if you really think about. And, you know, I know of companies that are so embracing hybrid working because they just believe that it will give them access and it'll make them so much more competitive. And from an employee perspective, wow. You know, so we have people that told us they dropped their cost um, of what they used to spend on rental and cars and stuff like that. They just dropped it hugely. They just moved into the suburban areas, right? And they have the ability now to work from there. So it's opened up, you know, jobs. It's opened up, uh, obviously, the opportunity to work from anywhere. It's also opened up the ability to participate in a global economy. Now, are companies going to embrace it? I think people are ready for it. Are companies going to embrace it? That's the big question, right? And we've been doing a lot of work with, with large companies around the world and saying, okay, guys, you can make this a reality of people that will go back to work and the ones that will work from home. How do the cultural aspects get blended in together? That's where the AI algorithms kick in, get the right person at the right place at the right time at the right cost. And if you can match that, I think you have a home run, but I'm usually encouraging this thought and topic around hybrid workplace and working. So. Thank you. Thank you, Dinesh. And I, I can see how the COVID scenario has had a, an accelerating impact on the shift to more remote or at least a more balanced view. I think the jury is still out whether, whether the world is going to move fully remote, be halfway. It's going to depend on the, the technological context of the respective companies. Um, where I'd like to take you next is how, considering the title of our panel and the, the, the minds we have here, clearly AI is, is the, the top of the pops in terms of the key words used. I think is also a word that has been trivialized over the past few years. Everyone is throwing around AI left and right. Um, everyone is throwing around data, privacy. Uh, clearly, we know the big, the large scale <laughs> scandals and debates in the industry. I'd like to encourage a, an open, fair and high integrity conversation in terms of AI and data. I think it's it's noble and it's respectable to say we are taking all of the steps necessary to debias our algorithms. The reality of the AI world is that sometimes it's even hard to define what is a biased algorithm, let alone debias it. So, in the context of the future of work, in the context of the future of talent, and the future of us as humans in in dance, in a balanced dance with technology. How would you, first of all, how would you define what it, what human is in the context of technology? And how do you translate that into an AI framework that needs to understand the aspects of us that make us human and then model itself, adapt itself to those facets of being human, whether we, some of them, whether we call them biases or we just don't understand them. And that is even more important when we talk about equalizing and we talk about giving access. We barely understand certain uh, demographics, certain ethnicities, certain combinations of age, location, ethnicity. And I think that is a, it's, it's a more detailed question, but I, I'd like to encourage you to dive a little bit deeper <laughs> on this when it comes to the integrity of your approach with AI data in the context of some more supporting the next phase of being human. Yeah. Can I take that question? Because I actually have a lot of thoughts on that. Um, I actually think we do the world a disservice. Um, when we start to say, oh, there's so many different types of bias and there's 21 different definitions of fairness and blah, blah, blah. And I mean, trust me, I've been on so many panels where that's you know what everyone starts to say. Um, I think, yes, 
that's not untrue. But I also think that, for example, Pemetrix took a very clear stance that uh, in the context of employment, bias means one particular thing. It means that, pe- for example, let's take gender. Men and women should pass our algorithms at equal rates. That's what it means to be unbiased. It's very clear. I mean, you can then have 20 other definitions of bias, but that's not our. That's not the definition that matters from a legal perspective, and that's not a definition that matters, I think, personally. When you ask people a normal person, somebody who's not, (laughs) hasn't read the latest machine learning paper, what does fairness mean? It means everyone's treated equally, right? And I think sometimes we throw around all this stuff and it really doesn't do the world the best service in my opinion, because it just then makes people think they can't understand and they're not able to contribute to the conversation. And I really want to sort of debunk that myth. I think most people know what fairness is when they see it. I do believe this. I mean, as a neuroscientist, I can tell you that we're hardwired to understand fairness, you know, from a very early age. Um, And I think that when it comes to employment um, and other things like, you know, access to education and housing, ensuring that our algorithms treat different people the same, um, whether it's, you know, irrespective of their gender, their ethnicity, their socioeconomic background, I think is just a fundamentally core concept of fairness. And so I think we should all anchor around that. Now, that's not to say that you know, somebody was like, well, you know, you make sure that men and women pass at the same rates. What about, you know, um, people that are not binary in terms of their gender? I'm like, you know what, that's an evolving frontier. And we'll have to think about that. I don't have an answer for you. Right. But that's not to say that right now I can't ensure that my algorithms, at least from a traditional uh, binary gender perspective, are in quotes fair. Does that make sense? And I'm sorry, I have a very strong feeling about this, because a lot of times people get, I think we hide behind this, I don't want to call it purposeful obfuscation, but sometimes it feels that way that people are like making it so complicated that, oh gosh, can't ever, you know, broach this question. And I really think that it is not the best approach um, when it comes to these matters, albeit they are very complicated. So. Uh, I, I couldn't agree thanks more. For, thanks for allowing me to sit on my, uh, stand on my soapbox for a minute. <laughs> and of course, I'll invite everyone to sit on their soapboxes, though I agree that we're talking about inclusion, but factually on a day to day basis, we're, we're complexifying these topics to such an extent that people feel excluded, feel intimidated just by the headlines, let alone being able to actually add value in some of those um, topics. Yes. Uh, who would like to get on their next soapbox? <laughs> It's not going to be nearly as articulate, and I, I'll try to keep it brief, but maybe just a couple, couple additional uh, lenses on, on, ha- on how this shows up. So I would say 100% of what Frida described of, like, I think generally companies need to take much stronger views and statements on saying, this is my line. Now, if you want to have a conversation about my line, let's, but not stay away from the courage of choosing, defining the line. I think that's critical, and it's the, the hiding behind walls is real. I think maybe two other just interesting examples to consider. So, for example, this idea of parity and sameness and treatment. Uh, one of the things we, I think, uh, one of the interesting questions for us has been, when it comes to sameness and treatment, uh, w- part of what we do is recommend to someone what career pathways they might want to consider and then what resources might help them best achieve the goal they have set for themselves. When it comes to showing career pathway recommendations, we do run the algorithms on a parity question, right? Is there any differential? When it comes to resource support recommendations, then it's a question of actually there are targeted populations that might need additional supports for equity to be achieved and actually more than others so that outcomes are similar and common. And so some of those nuances then become really important embedded product design and development questions, algorithm design and development questions that I think it's just a practice that's not built into engineering and product and and, uh, and data teams in a lot of companies. They go to a workshop and hear about bias, but it's not embedded into their um, design and development process. Yeah, and I think that's a valid point, especially when we look at um, uh, human-machine interactions, any, any form of human-computer interactions. I think challenge number one is really designing that AI engine in a way in which it's delivering value to whoever is sitting in front of it. And number two, making sure that that human computer interface, that interface there is conveying that value in in a way in which the 
the the human at the end at the on the other side of the engine can can access that value in a structured and thoughtful manner. Good. Before we dive into into the next topic, um, I like to ask for a specific example from each of you. If you think there is one one project or one area that. 2022 June that you think is worthwhile for people to focus on from here onwards when it comes to the relationship, the dance between human and technology. One specific area that you feel is deserves much more attention than it gets today. I just want to quickly highlight, I think we have a participant who'd like to jump in whenever you see that. Okay. I... I yeah, know. I think there was a mic, but that disappeared. So hi, ah, uh, here it is. <laughs> um, I am listening keenly because I am in humanities and I use technology um, in various ways. I've been teaching art virtually. Uh, I had to get new gadgets, learn new ways. So I'm grateful that I'm able to do it. I'm using the iPad to demonstrate how to draw and then my laptop mirrors it. So that part is great. And I've been teaching online since 2006, so it wasn't a shock. But where it gets complicated and really, really frustrating is that if a student wants to have an appointment with me, they have to go through 16 different steps to get to me. And there seems to be a gap between the engineers' minds. I don't know how that works because I developed my artistic side and how we use the technology. So I just tell them, stay after class. I just completely skip the technology there because it is, for lack of a better word, it's stupid to force uh, someone retired and wants to take um, art class to click on 16 different things to get to me to make an appointment. Or if someone is applying for a job because they have something unusual or different and then the computer cannot detect that. They say you're not qualified, even though they worked in that industry for 20 years. So those are the parts that like makes me think that uh, people are losing a lot of talent because of that. I came to really, really hate HR departments. Like if I were, <laughs> if, I, if it was in my power, I would get rid of the HR departments simply because the way they use the computer that cannot effectively and truthfully understand the skills of a person. So I had to intervene a number of times through the ethics um, department to say, no, this person is qualified. See, you didn't see this. Because they didn't even look at the application because computer couldn't detect it. So, so this is my love-hate relationship in the humanities. <laughs> <laughs> with, with technology. So I don't know if anyone else has something to say about that, but basically that's what I had in mind. Thank you. So if I synthesize from there two challenges, one is the human computer interface that helps certain demographics, certain age groups navigate better to get to an outcome, for example, booking a session. I have a specific recommendation there and I have no interest, but for me using a platform called Calendly to just send a link and for people to book a calendar entry has been earth shattering, <laughs> life changing <laughs> with all of the PAs in the world. Uh, so point one in terms of HCI interface being suitable for different age groups and for different demographics. And that I know for fact that is a continuous challenge. And there is a lot of research done in that space, but it's 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 adapting that to the different demographics, which is not yet quite intuitive. Uh, point number two, in terms of the role of different departments from from the traditional structure of an organization and maybe rather than me commenting on that I'll invite Frida to comment from the HR perspective because clearly her platform is dealing with that um, challenge day in day out yeah I mean I think it's it's a tough one I don't really have any real so again I like to get on the soapbox when I have a strong point of view and I like to not have <laughs> wishy-washy opinions when I, I you know, it's a, it's a tough challenge and I don't know that I have anything um, specifically to say, to say on that point. 
Uh, I'll add color from the perspective of uh, sure. we we are we are supporting HR departments around the world from the context of building a clear picture of what their human capital is and does, and really understanding humans in a 360 perspective. We've developed a life quality index that looks at nine dimensions, everything from physical, mental, career, social purpose, environment. I think people completely neglect environment and talk about it separately as an ESG, as if it's not us having an impact on the environment and the other way around. So I think there is a a maturity that is currently happening in the HR talent space and technology is, is a massive contributor in the space. We're seeing tremendous demand specifically during COVID has been a catalyst to For help sure. them better deal with the, with the plethora of challenges. And to do it justice, I think the, the HR department historically has dealt with everything <laughs> in a company admin, organization, salaries, recruitment, retention. So I, I really feel for them that they, they do need uh, technology solutions that make their life easier while accounting for, for the demographic because at times they are, they are more from the humanities rather than from hardcore quantum physics, <laughs> which is my world. So I think it's really important to acknowledge background of individuals when we think of designing a solution for that space. And as we've seen with HR solutions, they have been designed, I think there's a point earlier, they were designed for technologists, not necessarily for, for humanists. So I think that is space that our our space, our industries as a whole can contribute to make their lives easier and a lot more contributing to their teams. Yeah. I mean, the only thing I will say about, I think HR is just in a tough spot because I think historically they have been sort of the land of, you know, uh, employment law and, uh, you know, employee complaint, sort of a, a place that's been, you know, very much led from a compliance perspective. And now I think they're being asked to, you know, fix a lot of the world's problems, um, which, and you know, and, and I think about this a lot in terms of like, you know, is the historical um, person that's been, you know, tasked with HR at a company, the right person to be thinking about these and not, not that I don't mean this in a derogatory way. I just mean like, hist that's not their tr necessarily why they went into the field or what they're thinking about. And now we're sort of throwing these massive problems at them in terms of, you know, inequality and, you know, all of these really world changing concepts. Um, and it would be hard, I think, for any department at any company to, to deal with that. It, I just think about this a lot. It's a bit of a disconnect. And I, that's why I said I don't really have a great answer, but it's definitely an issue. It's a challenge and we can, we can reconvene the next year and see if we've moved forward. On this topic next, next century, maybe. <laughs> Good. We've got seven minutes to go. And I have a, I have a question that I'm very keen to, to hear on from each of you. So five years, uh, five years ago, I woke up with endless access to capital technology and knowledge. And I asked myself after ending my career in investment management, as one does, <clears throat> how can I contribute to the world? What is the one thing? What is, if, if I'm going to dedicate my life to one thing, what is the one thing in which I can contribute most to humanity, to, to the world at large? Not in a, you know, not in a want to change, save the world, <laughs> but in a more pragmatic, okay, what is the contribution that I can have throughout my lifetime? So I'd like to ask you <laughs> each, because each you are already making a, a very impactful contribution to humanity. If tomorrow you wake up and really have unlimited access to resources that are required, what is the thing that you consider will have the biggest impact on our lives as, a, as, a, as humanity of planet Earth for now? So I think maybe I'll go first, if that's okay, right now. Uh, you know, I actually was hearing the context around data, user experience, and, you know, all the other things that we could change, right? But I think if I really think about it, firstly, um, I think giving everybody the opportunity to play and participate in a fair manner is something that I feel very passionate about, right? Whether it's learning, it's working, or anything like that. And I think added to that, 
you know, I've kind of started to build this theory around why do we even need all these very large buildings that are out there and the space that is out there. We keep building, we have carbon emissions. We have a whole bunch of stuff that is going on over there. If we were able to solve the ability to give equal opportunity around work, learning, and be able to cut down on our footprint on spaces, I think it would make a big difference to humanity and Earth at large. So that would be my passion. Uh, if, 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 if I had unlimited resources, that's what I would change. Thank you, Dinesh. Please, wh whoever would like to jump on the soap now. <laughs> I'll, I'll jump in. <laughs> I'll jump in real quick. Um, you know, I think uh, something that I'm passionate about um, that I've alluded to, and if I had unlimited resources, I'd really figure out what's a strategy to shift from diagnosis and treatment to wellness and prevention um, worldwide. And, and there's technological solutions, there's behavioral solutions, there's, there's um, individualized solutions, there's community solutions. I mean, it's a big hairy audacious goal, which is what you, you asked about. Um, and then of course, there's lots of ways that, that uh, we can work on that without all the unlimited resources in the world. And just, um, I mentioned one of them sort of using platforms like, like smartphones. Um, and, and just one other I'll mention that I'm getting more and more involved in, and that's electroceuticals. So, so switching from pharmaceuticals, chemical um, responses uh, and to, to, um, to, to illness um, to electroceuticals, which also can be more on the wellness side, um, using electricity to keep our body healthy and in homeostasis. So I'll leave it there. Definitely close to my heart on prevention here. <laughs> Huge prevention focus. Good. Who would like to go next? Come on, Frida. <laughs> <laughs> either either one. Sure, uh, I'll make this quick. First of all, uh, Lorena, you dropped just a little data point in that uh, five years ago, you woke up unlimited everything. So that's the story I want to hear of what happened, <laughs> which island you woke up on, but that's separate. I think, um, you know, for me, uh, the, the one thing, it wouldn't actually be the immediate focus of uh, our work in our company, but I think like if there was one thing in my life, it would be canceling all debt for... Uh, uh, countries uh, around the world that are in debt to other countries because of historical systemat systemic oppression, essentially. Um, that's the one thing I would do. Thank you. Thank you for that. And to address just a, a slither of the question, you know, the limits on resources are mostly in our head. If, you, if there's enough creativity, I think you can access almost anything in today's world. Over to you, Frida. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to answer this question by saying that what I wish for, I don't, is not possible. But if we could do it, it'd be pretty amazing. So, um, you know, I would love to. So, as a cognitive scientist, part of the reason that I became intrigued in uh, in, in the in the world of artificial intelligence is because I saw how artificial intelligence could be. Um, built and audited in a way that human decision making cannot be. So if I had a magic wand, I would remove <laughs> all uh, gender, ethnic and socioeconomic bias from human decision making and the human brain. Again, it's not possible and it's not going to happen. But if I could, that's what I would hope for. Very intriguing. And I think as soon as we get a decent model of, of human cognition, uh, one that we can start iterating on. I think that's 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 the first step before we can start yeah, absolutely. Of, uh, removing biases. Thank you very much. Good. We are one minute away. It's been a real pleasure to have this conversation. I think we have touched on really big topics in the world today. We live in a world of extensive opportunities, knowledge, technology, and clearly humanity threatening challenges. <laughs> and the time to act is now. What I find fascinating is that we've got the tools, we've got the resources, we've got the brains. It really is in each of our hands every day. Not postponing it that I could do it next year. I could, just there is something little that you can definitely do today. And on that note, I want to thank you for, for being here with me today on the panel and look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank Thanks you very much, everyone. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>